After the dramatic axing of Kevin Rudd, Julia Gillard wasted no time going to the polls to give legitimacy to her Prime Ministership. She wasn't going to move into the lodge until she'd been endorsed by the Australian people. Well, that endorsement has been very slow coming and could fairly be described as muted at best. For her first television interview since the election, Julia Gillard joins me now from our Parliament House studio. Julia Gillard, uh, you've been handed a gift today, a chance to escape from the bad odour of those last few months of your government and the axing of Kevin Rudd, kind of a get-out-of-jail card in a way. How are you going to protect this gift? Well, this is an opportunity for the nation, Kerry, an opportunity for the nation to listen to what the Australian electorate told us at this election. I've heard the message loud and clear. People do want to see us more open, more accountable, more transparent. I am going to be held to higher standards of accountability than any Prime Minister in the modern age. I'm well aware of that, and I'm going to focus on being up to that challenge. And I'm also well aware that when we go to the polls next time, in 2013, Australians are going to hold me to account and I wouldn't have it any other way. Now, just on the election, there's a, there's a few things that would be good to clear up. You've, you've already said in writing that you're committed to serving a full three-year term and, uh, and you've actually said that you would work with independents to nominate a date for the next election in three years, which would be in the period August through October 2013. So you would sit down with, with whom? You'd sit down with the Green MP, you'd sit down with uh, Alan Wilkie, uh, you'd sit down with Rob Oakeshott and Tony Windsor at least and possibly even Bob Catter, is that right? <laughs> well, what I agreed here is that we would go for a full three-year term and carry the aim of each of the independents, though they came at it in different ways and ultimately made a different decision. Mr Catter made a different decision. But the aim of Mr Bant, Mr Wilkie, Mr Oakeshott and Mr Windsor was to form a stable and effective government. So in that context, I think it is fair that I say to them, we will basically work together to set the date of the next election election so that people have got security and comfort that the government's aim is to go for its full term and, do, and deliver stable and effective government for three years. But, uh, but a government uh, in, in this system, in the current system, always has uh, within its uh, scope the capacity to make its best judgment about the right time to go to an election. Are you saying, let's say you get to June, July of... Uh, of 2013. At that point, you'd sit down with this little band of people and say, OK, what do you think? What do you think? What, what's a good well, time to go? Uh, Kerry, we will conclude the discussions and we may well sit down well in advance and agree a date that the election should not be before so people have got certainty about the life of this parliament. OK, let's look at Bob Catter. In terms of the numbers of people that you will now be working with and on whom you can count... Bob Catter said today that even though he was announcing uh, for Tony Abbott that he would see a moral responsibility to look at the issue of stability in the event that you were to form a government. I've always got on with Julia and Leica and have been lavish in my praise for Wayne Swan. Sounds like he's having a quid each way and we'll hear from him <laughs> in a moment. But he says I would have no difficulty working with their government whatsoever. Have you got the, the generosity to ask him if he wants to come inside the net at this stage, even though you don't, strictly speaking, need his vote? Well, I'll certainly be pursuing uh, discussion and a relationship with Bob Catter. Uh, he has a vote in the House of Representatives. I worked with Bob Catter when I was Deputy Prime Minister. He would come and he would talk about issues that affected his electorate, and he is absolutely passionate about his electorate and the future of North Queensland. Now, we work through respectfully, courteously in this period. Ultimately, Bob didn't see it my way. I respect that, but we are going into a Parliament now, where I'll be Prime Minister. He is an important person. He represents a very important part of the country, and I'll be very open to continuing to work cooperatively with Bob Catter. I would, I would, I would think your circ your circumstance demands it. But uh, looking at Rob Oakeshott now, who you, and you've confirmed that you'd offered offered him uh, a place in your ministry. It sounds like a like a regional development portfolio. Would the, is that a cabinet position you're offering him? 
Well, look, my discussions with Rob have got some way to go. Uh, he is a uh, man who is passionate about delivery for regional Australia, as, of course, is Mr Windsor, and that has driven them uh, to talk with me and to talk through questions of broadband and how we best meet health and education needs and needs for infrastructure in regional Australia. In the course of those discussions, I have said to Rob Oakshock, o Oakshock that I would be uh, open to considering uh, him being a member of the executive team if he thought that was an added way of driving these changes through. Now, as he said, he's returning home to his family. He missed Father's Day. He's got a young family. He's got a baby on the way. Uh, he's got an electorate to look after. These are all real-world considerations. He'll have a think about it. We'll have a further discussion. Now, in making that offer, were you, did you have the South Australian experience in mind with uh, Mike Rand's uh, minority government as well? And in that circumstance... Would you accord Rob Oakeshott the, uh, the right, uh, while on the one hand uh, uh, accepting uh, ministerial responsibilities, uh, I mean, does that include cabinet solidarity? Uh, in other words, even if he disagrees with a policy, that he has to support it as a member of your ministry? Uh, and uh, at what point does he have the scope to vote against legislation he's not comfortable with as an independent? Well, Kerry, you raise an important set of questions and uh, if Mr Oakeshott were minded to make this decision, we'd have to be crystal clear about all of them. Uh, yes, I've looked at the South Australian example. I've looked at the Victorian example. Uh, as you would imagine, Kerry, not, not just me, but each of the independents, and I suspect Tony Abbott as well, has been uh, scouring around to see how minority governments have worked at various state levels and how people have uh, formed stable and effective long-term minority governments and that has happened. Now you point to an example where there was uh, a member of another political party in the cabinet in South Australia with the ability to say that she disagreed with the government policy and was going to vote a different way in the House, uh, how, the equivalent of the House of Representatives. Uh, now Mr Roachshot is obviously someone who jealously guards his independence, that's appropriate, so we would have to work those sorts of questions through if he was going to take this step. And including his right where he says in exceptional circumstances he may exercise his option of uh, voting no confidence in the government. Well, each of the independents, Mr Windsor, Mr Oakeshott, Mr Bant, Mr Wilkie, have, I think, properly said to me uh, that if they formed a view that there was, you know, fraud or some uh, major uh, problem that the government had created, some something uh, beyond the run of uh, everyday politics, but they came to a view that it was appropriate to return the parliament to the people for a further selection, that they would uh, want the ability to move and vote for a no confidence motion and of course that's appropriate uh, but each of them has said to me that they will provide confidence to the government and supply in all other circumstances. And uh, uh, Rob Oakeshott, potentially a future uh, minister in your government also said today that uh, Tony Abbott would make an equally good Prime Minister as yourself which would be an interesting position for you to have with one of your ministers. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, I think some generosity of spirit is called for at this time, Kerry, and uh, Tony Abbott did ring me and wished me well. I thanked him for that. I think that's a very generous gesture in quite difficult circumstances. And I said publicly at my first press conference, and I meant it, I believe the Australian people are sending all of us a message that they don't want to see needless partisanship. Now, there are big contests of ideas and values on display in Parliament House. And when we have those big contests of ideas and values, it should be a feisty, red-hot go. But people don't want to see bickering for the sake of bickering. And in this period, this extraordinary Parliament after the election that we've had, I believe it is appropriate, and I've said, we should look for the points of agreement between me and Tony Abbott, as well as the points of agreement between me, Mr Windsor, Mr Oakeshott, Mr Catter, Mr Wilkie and Mr Bant. OK, if we can look at your, your early priorities in this Gillard government. Uh, climate change has had a very chequered career within Labor's uh, first term uh, and even during the campaign. Um, when your climate change committee that you've agreed to with the Greens has been set up, which will be done, as uh, I think, by late this month, what time frame would you want to see for that committee and are you committed to seeing legislation come into the parliament within 
this term of office? Well, in the spirit of including people, Kerry, it's not for me to dictate. But what I would like to see from that committee is that we can genuinely include across the parliament people who believe climate change is real and who believe we will only reduce carbon pollution and meet our 2020 targets if we price carbon. And then with all of those people in the room, we'd work through to look for the points of agreement. I'm not going to prejudge, Kerry, how quickly that can be done. But I believe that there's a determination to approach this in a different spirit than the way the carbon pollution reduction scheme ultimately ended up being approached, where consensus was shattered and it was a matter of high partisanship between the major political parties. From your discussions, is it clear to you that you can have any confidence, for instance, in getting your mining tax uh, through the parliament? Uh, and, and have you considered the prospect that none of these three independents uh, may, may end up supporting uh, that leader. Certainly Bob Catter won't, and perhaps the others won't either. I'll ask them in a moment. But it is possible that you will not get your mining tax into law and therefore won't get the revenue. Uh, Kerry, you'll have to forgive me if today of all days I declare myself to be a very big optimist. Uh, and as a very big optimist, I believe I will be able to work through uh, to ensure that the agreement I struck with the major miners does become legislation. I think we can get cohesion and agreement around the proposition that uh, mining companies can pay a bit more tax. Obviously, mining companies themselves have said they can pay a bit more tax. And that that mining tax can go to some very important purposes, particularly infrastructure for regional Australia and for our great mining states, Queensland and Western Australia. You're, uh, you're one by-election away, potentially, from finding the rug pulled from under you at some point in the next three years. I know there's ifs and buts about that, but very real ones. That, uh, that suggests that you could end up running a, a somewhat timid government for fear of suddenly finding yourself facing that kind of situation. Are you aware of that and are you determined not to be a timid government? Uh, Kerry, I am not by dint of personality a timid person uh, and I have big ambitions for this country big ambitions in broadband, big ambitions for regional Australia that has asked in this process for its fair share, big ambitions for our economy, for making sure it offers people the benefits of work, big ambitions for our education system. And I think together we can address the challenges of the future. So you should expect, Kerry, to see me lead, but in a different style than has been done before, understanding that it's not a question of dictating, but a question of consulting and inspiring. That's what I intend to do. Very interesting time ahead, Julia Gillard. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for the opportunity.